welcome. It's my pleasure to uh, kickstart this uh, this week with a very interesting uh, event uh, that's going to focus on life sciences and their implications for uh, international security. Uh, Nancy, could you please mute your microphone? Thank you. Um, so, uh, why are we doing this uh, this event in the context that are the margins of the first committee? Well, because scientific and technological advances in, in different fields related to uh, life sciences are really accelerating and converging uh, to create novel, tool, novel tools that can offer considerable potential to address uh, many of humanity's greatest challenges, whether it's from climate change to detecting and mitigating the effects of infectious diseases. Um, however, the same advances can raise considerable safety, security, and ethical concerns, as they can potentially be exploited also for hostile purposes, and particularly for the development of biological weapons that be, may be more lethal and damaging than those of the past. Specifically, advances in biotechnology have really revolutionized uh, tools for the potential creation, production, and delivery of uh, biological agents. And you know, while naturally emerging uh, new and novel pathogens can cause severe damage, as we're currently experiencing with uh, uh, the COVID pandemic, genetically engineered or synthesized pathogens may have the potential to pose even greater risks to human health and uh, global stability. So in the backdrop of these scientific and technological advances, there are emerging trends in life sciences research, development, and innovation landscape. Think of, for example, the digitization of biology, the changing uh, research landscape, which is seeing the emergence of new actors uh, as a result of the uh, growth in kind of the do-it-yourself, so the DIY biology community, and the resulting decreased costs of uh, doing biology. So everything is becoming you know, cheaper, uh, faster, and uh, more accessible. In fact, such trends are accelerating the pace of technological exploration and innovation and are reducing the barriers to entry for a wide range of actors to tackle global challenges. However, the flip side of the coin is that the growing access to advanced biotechnology is also raising concerns among the arms control community regarding the potential ease and misuse of capability uh, for both offensive and defensive purposes. To complicate things even further, the dual use nature and the speed of technological innovation is posing a considerable challenge for existing governance approaches and frameworks uh, that are used to reduce risk of biological weapons proliferation at a point where biotech is growing even more important in responding to the 21st century's global challenges. Now, over the next 75 minutes in this webinar, we're going to try to explore what are some of these te technological trends that we're referring to and talking about, and at the same time, what are some of the governance gaps in the life sciences that can be potentially uh, be used and discussed in the context of the first committee and the biological weapons convention. We're going to try, you know, it's a very ambitious goal in 75 minutes, so we're going to try to uh, identify some key takeaways for the arms control and disarmament community to keep reflecting on uh, in the future. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do this by myself, so I'm joined today by uh, two uh, great speakers. Uh, Nancy Connell, who is a senior scholar at the John Hopkins Center for Health Security and professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering. Um, she you know, has a long experience also in directing uh, uh, lab research in antibiotic drug discovery. So she's not only, you know, she also has the hands-on practical experience that, that hopefully will, will be very useful in the context of this, of this webinar. And we're also joined by Philippe Alensos, who's a senior researcher fellow, senior research fellow, sorry, at King's College London, where she has a joint appointment in the Department of War Studies and the Department of Global Health and uh, Social Medicine. She's a biologist and a social scientist by training. And she has been uh, researching and been actively involved in biological disarmament and non-proliferation for over 15 years. So really, over the course of the next 75 minutes, we're going to explore with Nancy some of the technology that we're, are more increasingly relevant in the field of life sciences. And then together with Philippa, we're gonna to try to understand more of what are some of the gaps and uh, potential actions in the governance framework. 
So uh, before we start, I just wanted to remind all of you that you can ask questions using the Q&A uh, function uh, over, over Zoom. It's in the chat box. Please submit your questions in writing and uh, I'll make sure to integrate them in the discussion or at the, uh, after the presentations in the, in the Q&A part. So without further ado, uh, Nancy, you should be able to control your, share your screen and control your presentations. And if so, uh, please, Nancy, you have the floor. You are muted. Sorry, Nancy, you are muted. I'm so happy to be here with my colleagues, uh, Philippa Lenzos and Giacomo Poli, and all of you to um, have an interesting discussion this afternoon. My presentation will be based on the paper shown here, which was a product of a fruitful collaboration among the people, um, among people with converging expertise. I'll first acknowledge the talents of uh, Kelsey Lane Warmbread, who's a virologist extraordinaire. Um, she's just finished six months at WHO, lending her expertise in support of the pandemic response, um, and is now a PhD candidate uh, in uh, public health genetics at the University of Washington, as well as being a, uh, a, an analyst at the Center for Health Security at Johns Hopkins. And Jamie Revel, scholar and researcher at UNIDIR's uh, Weapons of Mass Destruction and Other Strategic Weapons Programs, who is, a, who is a fine product of Harvard Sussex, the Bradford Programs, Landau Network, Volter Center, and, and other uh, distinguished uh, places. So why are we discussing emerging technologies and arms control? What are the drivers or the motivations for this, for this concern? Um, as Giacomo has already pointed out, innovations are cheaper, they're more accessible, they're more widely disseminated. I would refer you here to the Innovations Dialogue from August 20th um, and a couple of, uh, of lectures of note, in particular Andrew Hessel's remarkable, uh, really tour de force discussion of the basics of genomics and DNA technology and relating these advantages to changes in scientific, into the, the entire sci scientific enterprise, bringing in globalization and, and the digitization of, um, of science in a truly remarkable way. We also discussed um, uh, do-it-yourself laboratories, and I think that is a point of um, as we think about accessibility and dissemination. Top four uh, trillion US dollars over the next 10 to 20 years, over the next you know, few decades, and we all know that biotechnology has impacted every aspect of all of our lives and may hold the solution to many social problems that we're dealing with. And then finally, I'll just mention the, the so-called fourth industrial revolution and we'll quote Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum who pointed out that technological advances in general have the potential to raise global income levels and improve the quality of life for millions. In fact, um, uh, population. However, we're worried. Uh, these same technologies, as we all know, present risks and uncertainties. Accidents happen. Uh, we know that uh, in addition to accidents happening, we know that there may be unforeseen or, or unanticipated consequences of ma many of these technologies. There has been, there may be, and there may be in the future misused by both state and non-state actors. And the indirect effects of a lot of these technologies on social inequity, on labor markets, and so on, are a major topic of concern. And finally, there's always the possibility of a low probability but high risk scenario, in both in biology, physics, chemistry, um, and I would refer, refer you to the writing and of Sir Martin Rees, and colleagues um, who have been concerned about this for many decades. So what was our approach in the paper? Our approach was to think about three technologies on the left, which, which would be DNA and RNA related technologies, the ability to read or sequence, the ability to write or um, uh, synthesize, and the ability to modify or edit genes. Um, Secondly, we'll consider nanotechnology, 
Uh, and thirdly, we'll consider the, uh, the impact of, or the, the impacts of um, artificial learning, artificial, artificial intelligence and machine learning. But I'd like to overlay all of, all, over all of this, the digitization of all of these approaches as Giacomo earlier pointed out. We then took these three technologies on the left and applied them in a cross-cutting kind of matrix across the fields of immunology, neurosciences, reproductive technologies, agriculture, and infectious disease. And while in 10 or 15 minutes, uh, it's impossible for us to actually cover five enormously, uh, enormous uh, and, and fast moving fields in the life sciences, we will focus a bit on the methodologies and then look at the sort of matrix of how the three technologies across the top impact the five uh, fields across the uh, x-axis. Uh, for example, um, in the convergence of DNA technologies with agriculture, we're all thinking about gene drives. The idea that gene editing um, can actually create novel forms of plants, insects, and perhaps animals. Um, that can um, novel forms of genes that can be um, that can be inserted into these organisms, and those organisms can then be inserted into populations and replace the existing populations in just a few generations, bypassing normal evolution. While gene drives are close to being implemented uh, um, in, for example, controlling the spread of infectious disease through mosquitoes and malaria, for example, the, me the methodology is, um, has not yet been released. Uh, and one of the concerns, of course, is the idea of stopping such a, such a process once it begins. Um, I should just add here that people are working very hard to figure out ways to reverse gene drives, but the only thing that reverses a gene drive is another gene drive. So the methodology you can see opens up a new pathway to weaponization, doesn't take a lot of, a lot of imagination to see why, with devastating effects perha perhaps on the food supply or the targeting of specific groups of people indirectly through the, uh, through the, um, through the changes, through changes in environmental uh, conditions. Uh, here's another convergence, which would be, which would be nanotechnology um, and uh, infectious diseases, or medicine in general. So I'm sort of lumping this all together. And here I'd just like to mention nanobots and the idea that these tiny, tiny uh, nanomachines um, are well on the way to development and should probably de be deployed in the late 2020s, which is coming up, um, for the purpose of precision drug delivery, uh, uh, attacking of tumors, reducing of plaque, for example, fixing cellular damage. These tiny, um, these tiny uh, little machines would be released into the blood system and, and travel very quickly. Um, biosensors are already under development to, to be able to detect a disease early. Doesn't take, again, much imagination to imagine, uh, uh, to, to imagine what kind of weapon could be created with this technology. Um, but one also should keep in mind, and through this whole talk, the idea of sabotage of many of these tech technologies. This one in particular, I'm thinking of the idea of um, uh, 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 fragmenting of cyber biosecurity um, oversight so that, uh, so that the, the final um, products of these, nano, nano, of these nanobots can be altered. Another convergence final example here would be the convergence of, uh, of artificial intelligence and machine learning and in infectious diseases. So uh, I've shown here um, a, a, a screenshot from NextStrain, which is an open source global uh, collaborative um, method, um, method site to track the spread of COVID, of SARS-CoV-2 around the globe. Um, and this is you know, a remarkable ability, but, we, but these kinds of techniques can also be used to track for example, data across a single person's life to anticipate problems ahead, or could be applied um, at a population level to, to track population genetics and human sequencing analysis. This could open up the possibility of identifying vulnerabilities in specific populations that could be targeted by, uh, by biological weapons. So let's take a brief uh, look at, the, at each of these three technologies. First, we'll think about DNA sequencing, Synthesis and modification as cheap as this, which 
is from a um, group. Um, there are number uh, human genome sequences and looking for patterns and so on. Gene synthesis is getting more efficient. It's still, the process is still chemically based, but um, I would just uh, add that um, a recent study, a recent paper in the in Science magazine has uh, indicates that enzymatic sequencing uh, is getting closer. We're, it's got a lot of problems with it. Many of those problems are being solved, but the idea solved, but the idea of using the enzymes from nature that synthesize DNA, harnessing their power and their speed to be able to synthesize very long pieces of DNA. Um, in other words, entire genes, rather than our current process, which is small pieces of DNA that are ligated together. Um, and one can see immediately that this will change the, uh, a lot of the uh, work that's in, in, certainly in synthetic biology, in the field of synthetic biology. Um, keep in mind that several of the front runner, sort of so-called front runner vaccines for COVID actually re require gene synthesis for their, for their uh, development. And then finally, uh, modification or ed gene editing, the most famous is CRISPR, um, the recent Nobel Prize to, uh, to two women, Duden and Charpentier, will um, illustrate to us the value and impact and, um, uh, and uh, the, uh, the immense effect that CRISPR is having on biotechnology in general. The second technology is nano. And um, I just, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about with nano, Kobe Leans uh, uh, has made a wonderful um, way of um, allowing us to think about what, a nan what the nanometer, nanometer scale is. So I have an arrow pointed to a small dot. So the relationship of that dot to an apple, the dot representing a nanobot, it's, uh, you know, the scale of, of nanotechnology is the same as the relationship between an apple and the earth. So that is the logarithmically small um, the distance between us and, and the size of these astonishing machines. Um, these uh, nanotechnology has been already applied over the past couple decades to consumer products, surface treatments, information communication, heavy and light industry, food and food processing, medicines, drug delivery, environmental modification, and so on. It's a, a truly remarkable, uh, has a truly remarkable range of effects on pretty much every aspect of our lives. Um, many of us are not aware of the impact of nano, uh, nanotechnology on um, everything that we do. I've illustrated here, these two little square boxes are actually um, drug delivery mechanisms. So these are made of, uh, these are little nano um, drug delivery uh, systems that are called DNA origami. So it's origami that's kind of constructed into these shapes and then can the box can kind of open up and release a drug into the appropriate site, whether it's um, cr crossing a blood brain barrier and other places that have been difficult to, to meet. And then finally, nanobots and nanomachines, which have gotten a lot of attention um, and we discussed earlier. And then final, the final technology is thinking about um, AI and machine, artificial intelligence and machine learning converging with other technologies to really create an extraordinary array of, um, of activity. So cyber, biotech, computing, remote technology, robotics, uh, additive manufacturing, and so on. The impact of AI, as we all know, even on our communication efforts and our, uh, and our um, um, social media uh, is just is um, really overwhelming. So um, I'll neglect here to, um, or I'll avoid here of discussing each of these fields since they're quite huge. <laughs> um, but I think that uh, we all have a sense of what kind of um, the importance of immunology in everyday life. We're all struggling trying to understand the immunology of COVID, for example, of COVID-19. Neurosciences, every day we learn of new uh, advances in that field, reproductive technologies, um, agriculture, and infectious disease, which is what we think about the minute we wake up every morning these days. And here's our matrix. So um, each of these uh, boxes illustrates one single convergence um, um, of some kind of concern. 
Um, I would say that lost in many of these uh, convergences is an early discussion of the um, of the, the the balance of the enormous promise of each of these developments and the sa uh, and safety and environment. So um, we've talked about a few of these specifically, and I think in our general discussion we can address a few more. But I'd like to talk a little more about the. Um, about how these convergences and uh, the, uh, the results of our sort of matrix analysis um, relate to the BWC. <clears throat> and as you can see, this slide has way, too many, um, has way too many words. This is taken directly from our paper, but I've reduced it here to think more specifically about how uh, many of the articles uh, are directly affected or have impl or, or these convergences of developments in science and technology have implications for the BWC. As far as Article One is concerned, um, the uh, this the the overarching article, of course, of the of the of the convention, never under any circumstances to acquire or retain biological weapons or, importantly, means of delivery. Um, we recognize now that we need to broaden the spectrum effects, despite the um, or in addition to the to the to the enormous uh, breadth or foresight given to designing. Uh, the BWC, we still need to think about how um, how the effects of S&T are, are, um, are expanding. Dig the digitization of, of, uh, of, of, um, um, of all life sciences means that there are now challenges to things like export controls, which would affect um, Article 2 to destroy or divert peaceful purposes, for peaceful purposes. Um, Article 4, which are measures to prohibit and prevent the development of biological wep weapons, have we actually considered any necessary measures, um, uh, individual states, parties, or the BWC as, as a whole? Article 6, to request the UN Security Council to investigate alleged breaches. We know now that in addition to the creation of novel kinds of agents um, or threats, we also have um, an increased ability to examine them with many of these developments. Article 7, to assist states which have been exposed to a danger as a result of a violation. We have enhanced response capabilities um, and as related to, to Article 6 also, um, uh, investigation allegations. And then finally, Article 10, which is to encourage cooperation and, and exchange of the peaceful, for the pe peaceful use, use, uses of biological science and technology. Digitization has also eased collaboration and cooperation um, among states parties. And I would just point out um, as an illustration that, uh, that, the, that the pandemic has um, caused us all to stay home, but then communicate more in some ways uh, virtually. Um, and that has been, a, I think, a, an interesting development. I'll just end with a quotation from Matt Messelson. During the century ahead, as our ability to modify fundamental life processes continues its rapid advance, we will be able not only to devise additional ways to destroy life, but we'll also become able to manipulate it, including the processes of cognition, development, reproduction, and inheritance. In a world which these capabilities are widely employed, employed for hostile purposes would be a world in which the very nature of conflict has radically changed. So we see in 2001 that Matt Messelson was looking ahead to the uh, to the the promises and the challenges of life technologies as it relates to biological weapons arms control. So thanks very much, and um, I'll take questions, or perhaps we'll go on to the next talk first. I'm I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for this uh, quick yet very informative overview of the not only the range of technologies but also the potential applications that these technologies could have in, in different fields and also for drawing the kind of uh, the, the connection between all of this and, and the BWC, which is kind of a, uh, the main regulatory framework that we are uh, concerned about in, in the context of uh, arms control and, and disarmament when it comes to biological weapons, which is a, also a good bridge or, or link to uh, Philippa's presentation. And I have a few questions uh, for you, but I'm going to wait until uh, until the end, and I'll take this opportunity uh, to do two things. One is to remind participants who want to submit questions to uh, do so using the chat, um, and also uh, 
in in uh, Nancy's presentation, you heard reference to papers, to our conference, Innovations Dialogue. I'm going to be saying uh, uh, a little bit more about those uh, uh, towards the end of this uh, event. But in the meantime, we've been using the chat box to send you the links to all of the publications that have been mentioned, as well as to the uh, event page of the Innovations Dialogue for your reference, uh, if you want to learn more or uh, go deeper into any of the issues after the event. So, uh, Philippe, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Giacomo, and thank you so much for hosting this panel and for uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, good morning to those of you in New York and the rest of the Americas, and um, good evening to those of you in uh, Asia and, and further east. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here for a second. Let's see. Here we go. Um, also, I wanted to thank Nancy for your really uh, terrific presentation, giving such a clear overview of some of the key innovations in the life sciences at the moment, um, and also for dovetailing so nicely um, onto my presentation, in which I'm going to be focusing really um, more on the governance aspects. Um, I wanted to start with some fundamentals. First, how should we really think about S&T, science and technology? Do we believe there is something inevitable about innovation and technological uh, progress? Um, and that we as a society just have to deal with the consequences? Are we technological determinists essentially? Well, I am not a technological determinist. I don't believe that technology is in control of us. And it's an important point to make because science, from my perspective, science and technical innovation take place in a social context. So while the technical side is of course um, incredibly uh, important, we mustn't let it blind us and make us feel powerless. Uh, and you certainly can do that when you listen to some of the sorts of trends that are ongoing at the moment in, in uh, the life sciences and particularly when it comes to that convergence between different uh, technologies. Instead, I think we must emphasize how the choice and the design um, and deployment of technologies require moral and political choices. So we, or rather you, um, have the power to influence and shape these choices. Well, okay, so how do you do that in terms of the life sciences? Well, luckily you don't have to start from scratch. Um, to prevent misuse, we've already got a longstanding multi multilaterally agreed convention in place, the BWC, um, and that comprehensively prohibits the use of viruses, bacteria, and their components for non-peaceful purposes. The convention also embodies and enshrines the norm against using disease as a weapon as well as the broader norm against using science to deliberately cause harm. But now I want to go back to fundamentals again. How should we think about the BWC? Well, the way I think about it is in at least three different ways. And the first of which is as a legal document. It's a treaty between states embodying this norm against using disease as a weapon. But in addition to a legal document, and bear with me here, in addition to a legal document, I also think of the BWC in terms of a means for states and civil society to communicate about biological threats and how to respond to them. This is primarily about the disarmament community coming together at um, MXs or MSPs, PrepCons and RevCons, but it's also about confidence building information exchanges like uh, the CBMs or peer reviews. And it's also about procedures and um, for consultations and, and for clarification. And then there's this third layer where I think of the BWC in terms of dual use research and activities and the individuals and inst institutions involved in that. So these are the, basically the ultimate target group, right, for the treaty. 
the practitioners, the scientists, the technicians, the um, technologists. So let me elaborate or talk you through some of the, what I think are the current key governance implications for you. Um, well, as I see them in any case. So as I said, the BWC is first and foremost a legal document. So in it, states parties say, and you see this at the bottom of the slide, if you can, if you can read it, um, that they are determined to exclude completely the possibility of biological agents being used as weapons. And Article 1, um, as Nancy already said, of the BWC states that states parties will never under any circumstances acquire or retain biological weapons. What does this mean in terms of governance action? Well, it basically means that it's important for states to reaffirm their commitments to the BWC. And at first committee, there is, uh, this is generally done through the annual BWC proposal traditionally put forward by Hungary. This year is no exception to that. And the resolution was formally introduced by Hungary in the statement last Friday, so just a few days ago. The BWC resolution is usually fairly uncontested um, and has so far always been adopted by consensus. And there are no indications the resolution will not also be adopted by consensus this year. And in addition to that, in, in, in last week's general debate statements, we saw that 55 individual states and five groups of states, uh, ASEAN, CARICOM, the EU, NAM, and SECA, all recognized their responsibility to reaffirm commitments to the treaty, and they reiterated their support for the BWC. Now, if you will just uh, allow me a cheeky plug here um, for, and an, uh, um, an analysis of the statements that were given in general um, in the general plenary last week at first committee. This uh, the first committee monitor was out this morning, and it has there a piece by me analyzing those uh, statements. Moving on, um, it's. It is also important for states to reaffirm their commitment to the Geneva Protocol, which prohibits the use of biological weapons. And at first committee, this is done through the biannual Geneva Protocol resolution, which was first introduced, which was, my apologies, which was introduced by Indonesia on behalf of the NAM on October 9th, so Friday a week ago. The Geneva Protocol resolution has so far always been agreed. Uh, though usually with a small number of regular um, abstentions. So, so that's great. We all support the BWC and the Geneva Protocol. But is that enough in terms of addressing the advances we're seeing um, in the life sciences and then Nancy so helpfully laid out for us? What do these advances mean for the treaty? Well, again, Nancy very helpfully already provided an article by article breakdown. I want to, hard, uh, to highlight Article 1. Are key security concerns covered? Well, in addition, in additional understandings agreed at review conferences of the BWC, states parties have agreed that the BWC unequivocally covers all viruses, bacteria, and toxins, whether they're naturally or artificially created or altered. The BWC also covers their components. So maybe not an entire virus, but only a, a, a gene or a sequence of genes from a virus or a bacteria, let's say. So that's pretty darn comprehensive when it comes to microbes and biological agents. But what if we're not dealing with microbes or biological agents. And you'll see if you pay attention to what is going on in life science innovation, a lot of what's going on is actually not about viruses and bacteria. So let me give you an example. If you use entirely synthetic base structures, so creations that are inspired by DNA or RNA, but that don't actually qualify, they're not actually DNA or RNA, RNA or any other known naturally occurring nucleic acid, 
So if you use these kinds of synthetic based structures to deliver payloads into human bodies that instead of having direct detrimental effects on our bodies or that of any organism, just interfere with biological processes uh, or perform purely mechanical functions. Would that then be covered? Well, this is a real concern because potential future biological weapons won't necessarily use viruses or bacteria to make us sick. They could potentially directly target our immune systems or our nervous systems or our genomes or our microbiomes. This is what Nancy's uh, report is talking about when it says broadening the spectrum of effects far beyond traditional understandings of biological weapons. So the legal status of biological agents or of developments in science and technology in general is an important issue. There are some uncertainties about the scope of the BWC and a bit of work is needed here to clarify that the intent of the BWC is most certainly also covers these sorts of eventualities. But our work is not done with just that. So let's think about the BWC in terms of a means for states and civil society to communicate about biological threats and how to respond to them. And you'll find there's room for strengthening here too. Now, a whole list uh, was provided in various first committee statements last week. So some states spoke of the need for greater international cooperation and assistance and biopreparedness. Others spoke of proper and sustained financial support for the treaty. Some states highlighted more institutional capacity and in fostering synergies between relevant international organizations. Others emphasized improving implementation of the treaty's confidence building measures and adopting additional transparency measures like peer review. Of particular relevance to s and is establishing a scientific advisory body, which some states also mentioned. States parties need to establish a dedicated technical body and you'll quickly understand why, ha having now followed my example of what might lie outside the convention, it can very quickly get very technical in the BWC. So states parties need to establish a dedicated technical body, such as an open-ended working group under the BWC to monitor the relevant s and technological and technological developments, to also consider how their bearing or potential bearings on the BWC and to formulate individual and collective action to address possible changes. At the moment, s and review is the responsibility of individual states parties, but it's also important to do so collectively. A dedicated technical process will provide a more robust and comprehensive technical foundation on which to build policy conclusions. And this is actually one of the few areas that states parties more or less agree on. We need some sort of review process. What it's less or what it's more difficult to find agreement on is the detail of what that kind of review process would actually look like. So for example, should it be open-ended or closed? If it's closed, should members be elected or should they be nominated? And of course, membership should be based on technical cred credentials. But how broad or how narrow do you have to draw the disciplinary lines? And how do you deal with geographic representation? And then you have the difficult question of scope or terms of reference. Should the group focus on identifying developments and uh, science and technology trends? Or on considering the implications uh, or both? or on formulating action points. Who decides what should be covered? The group chair, the state's parties, the, the meeting of state's parties chair for that particular year, some combination. Cost is a massive issue. Who covers participation costs? Is there a sponsorship program? Are meetings only to take place in a single language to reduce interpretation and translation costs? 
there are also other questions around guidance and coordination. Who provides oversight of the group? Who chairs it? Where does administrative support come from? A dedicated scientific officer in the ISU would be great, but this of course would require funding. And finally, there are open questions around how to access external access, external expertise, and how the technical body or, or working group would report back to BWC states parties. So in the last uh, few minutes available to me, I want to highlight a third way in which I think about the BWC, and that is in terms of dual use research and activities and the individuals and institutions that are involved in that. What implications does that have for you as the first uh, committee dele delegate? Well, your gut reaction may well be that it's got nothing to do with first committee delegations, but it does. You provide a steer for what is acceptable or not for the international community and what standards should be kept to. This is all about education and awareness raising. It's about guidelines and it's about codes of conduct. The principal aspect that I want to highlight here is the need for a new institution in the space between the security and the health worlds. I believe that we, or rather you, urgently need to establish an international body ideally UN-based, to monitor and inspect high containment facilities and high-risk biological research activities. Globally, there are now well over 50 biosafety level four laboratories, either in operation or under construction, spread throughout Asia, Africa, Europe, Russia, and the US. These high containment labs carry out some of the most dangerous manipulations of pathogens with pandemic potential. While they are built to protect researchers as well as the public and the environment from harm, lab design can't fix everything. Lab design cannot overcome human error or poor training. And with each experiment comes opportunities for accidental exposures and inadvertent infections or releases. And accidents happen all the time in labs around the world, as Nancy uh, already touched on. On the slides, if you want to know more about this, on the slides um, are a couple of great in-depth articles from the New Yorker and the South China Morning Post that have come out recently. They're very accessible and I, I highly recommend them. But in addition to these growing, growing number of high containment facilities, um, there are developments in the research activities that are going on. And should the intent be there, and I'm not saying it is, but should it be there, advances in science and technology, and especially in genomic technologies, are significantly facilitating the enhancement of pathogens to make them more dangerous, the modification of low risk pathogens to become high impact pathogens, the engineering of entirely new pathogens, or even the recreation of extinct high impact pathogens like the variola virus that causes smallpox. We would also be able to develop ultra targeted biological weapons. So Nancy met, again mentioned this very briefly, targeting specific groups or even a specific individual based on their genetics. These possibilities are all coming at a time when new delivery mechanisms for transporting pathogens into human bodies are also being developed. So in addition to the bombs, missiles, cluster bombs, uh, sprayers and injection devices that we know or are familiar with from past biowarfare programs of the last century, it would now also be technically possible to use drones, nanorobots that Nancy again spoke about even insects as vehicles to deliver dangerous pathogens into bodies or animals or plants. First committee has a mandate to establish this sort of international body. You need, you as first committee delegates need to seriously consider how to make the broader biological disarmament architecture 
more fit for purpose in today's world. And a coordinating body or a body in its own right to monitor high risk facilities and activities is an important aspect of that. The proposal by Kazakhstan to establish an international agency for biological safety is a good start. And it provides plenty of scope, the proposal provides plenty of scope to negotiate its exact remit, its structure and way of functioning. I think we should, I think this sort of body that Kazakhstan uh, proposed should be a specialized autonomous organization set up by and reporting to the UN General Assembly. I believe it should monitor and inspect high containment facilities and high-risk biological activities throughout the world. I think it should investigate suspected outbreaks of international concern as soon as initial reports emerge and regardless of any indications of it being natural, accidental or deliberate. At the moment, the BWC doesn't have this sort of mandate in the security world and likewise in the health world, the WHO doesn't have this sort of mandate. We need to find that space in between the health and security world. And finally, such a body might even um, conduct or coordinate independent in-depth in investigations of suspected bioweapons use should any such uh, signals be there or any indications be there that it is actually a deliberate introduction of a disease. And so uh, just for the sake of completion, here is my list of key priority governance actions for uh, First Committee this year um, and uh, presumably also in the next uh, round uh, next year. Uh, and with that, I thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Philippa. And uh, uh, thank you both of you for very uh, interesting and uh, informative presentations. And over the next 25 to 30 minutes or so, uh, we're going to go over some questions. I, I already received a couple from, uh, from the floor. Uh, let me uh, inform all of our participants that we are um, recording this webinar, so the, the recording will be made available on our website, so you can download it or, or, or look at it in streaming later, and we also uh, make available the PowerPoint for your reference. Um, so, uh, Nancy, one of the things I, I, I noted during your presentation is that at some point you mentioned that there are already millions of human genomes that have been sequenced. Um, for those of us who aren't uh, exactly experts in this uh, in this field, what, what does that mean? Like, what what can you do for good and bad with with these genomes? So the idea of um, of having literally millions of uh, of sequ you know sequences the the detailed you know four nucleotides A C G T um, lined up aligned. Um, and stacked together means that we can, that scientists can actually analyze, um, begin to analyze as uh, the function of these genes. So uh, many of these, uh, of these gene sequences, of these human gene sequences or the samples that were provided for sequencing are linked to uh, medical data, to personal data. So while you know there are issues with HIPAA and you know privacy and so on. Um, you know, one can, starting from the assumption that the medical data associated with these gene sequences is protected, you know, de-identified. Um, it's important to recognize that <clears throat> we're beginning to use we can begin to use these huge data sets to try and figure out how each of our genes functions and how um, there may be groups of individuals who uh, have medical characteristics that are linked to certain kinds of sequences. So I'm trying to, uh, to make this, um, you know, kind of from a 30,000 foot, you know, um, uh, view. So, uh, so that means that, um, and I'm moving directly to, uh, to, to what both Philip and I have referred to, which is the idea of using this kind of data for weapons design. Um, what this means is either on a personal level, you know someone is susceptible or has some kind of chink in their armor um, from 
from knowing now how what the function is of all these genes um, or an entire population could be could be determined to be susceptible in one way or, or another to a immunological or neuro, neurological intervention as as philippa stressed um, or some other kind of um, intervention uh, if i could just i just would like to add that you know the power of being able to know exactly how our genes are functioning in disease um, is you know is remarkable and the the idea that we can start thinking about about more and more um, of illness from a genetic basis is is great um, that being said this is also um, many of these many i think that many of the um, of the benefits of this kind of work i mean can't be applied over eight billion people and so there will be, I think, um, social inequities that will be uh, likely social inequ inequities that will be um, exacerbated by this direction in um, so-called personalized medicine. Thank you. And I, and I have a follow-up question, but I'm going to wait because first there is some uh, a question coming from the floor, which uh, I'm going to read to uh, both of you. And please, uh, uh, you, you decide who, who take the first uh, go at it. So the question reads as follows, how do we tackle parallel multilateral processes regulating biotechnology? For example, WTO and Cartagena for protocol. This has resulted in stagnancy on discussion on regulation of genome editing and new biotechnologies. So who would like to have a first go? Um, Philippa, yours. Okay, thanks. <laughs> well, I think, thank you uh, for the question. I think I think it's very pertinent and it certainly shows how pervasive uh, genome, genomic technologies really are. They really do uh, impact so many facets of our life. It really is this fourth industrial revolution that, that Nancy mentioned in, in her presentation. How do the different multilateral mechanisms impact on that? Well, they come at it from different angles, right? In this forum, we're talking about peace and security. So that's one set of institutions, regulations, treaties. Um, another uh, area that I also mentioned was health, right? So the WHO and controlling disease outbreaks, those sorts of things, it also impacts in that area. Um, you mentioned uh, the Cartagena Protocol. Um, this is related um, and trade. This is more related, say, to the environment. Um, Nancy just talked about ethics and social inequities. That's another angle. So there are many aspects of these technologies and now you've got different uh, parts of the multilateral machinery looking at those angles. But I think what's important um, to emphasize is that they hopefully, if it all works, well should be reinforcing each other right um, so um, it might seem confusing at first but I think there are some clear lines for where they uh, have their own special mandates there are some areas where they do overlap and increasingly so as things converge um, but um, but I think uh, yeah it, it's fairly traditionally these domains have been fairly separate but as as you point out they are converging now so uh, it does get messier i did hear the word stagnation in the question uh, and so um if we could maybe address that or um was the question about stagnation in the advance of biotechnology or stagnation in the in the governance uh, uh in, in the governance of um of biotech or technical uh, advances from my reading of the question is on the discussions and governance issue governance not, issues yes yeah. not on the patents okay okay would you like to add something to, to this or well i think you know there uh, that um, among uh, so so um, among the kind of the the target the targets of philip's third point which are the 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 institutions and the individuals who carry out research and activities that are are that are interpreted as um as dual use in in our in the field of life sciences anyway and others as well 
Um, there are those who feel that that, that gov these governance mechanisms can stagnate, can you know prevent uh, progress. And um, I would just argue that I see no real <laughs> prevention of progress so far. I think things are moving along quite rapidly. And uh, and I would so I would would have argued back against the idea that um, that concern uh, with governance and our and the sort of global urgency with which this is being addressed is not uh, has doesn't seem to have um, have blocked anything. So perhaps to our detriment. So. Thank you. I'm, I'm very pleased to, to report that there are many questions coming in from the, from okay. the audience. Uh, so the uh, next question is uh, directly to, uh, to Philippe, um, which uh, reads as follow. Uh, so last year, you had a Unidir uh, publication on uh, compliance and enforcement in the biological weapons regime, elaborating on several layers of verification measures. And the question is, how would you envisage the verification measures uh, after uh, the COVID-19 that would be both necessary and uh, acceptable? Well, I'm glad to hear people are actually reading my publication. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, it's a difficult question, I would say, because um, at the very end, you say, um, would be uh, necessary and acceptable. What is acceptable to everybody is very difficult, but let me back up. So what my um, publication last year focused on was essentially the BWC regime on its own. I think what we've seen with COVID-19 is that the security regime is very much also interacting with the health regime. And I think what's missing is this space between the security and the health world. And that is why my last uh, recommendation that I talked about in my presentation was really about elaborating some sort of international body, ideally UN based, that sort of fills this gap between the security world and the WHO and the health focused world. Because clearly if there is some kind of outbreak and we don't know what caused it, um, there's no reason for the BWC to go in um, and the, the WHO has no mandate to go in unless it's invited to go in and certainly then it wouldn't be, uh, then it would be to help in terms of the the response to any sort of outbreak. It would not be as investigation to figure out what caused it. So I think we need a sort of body in the middle there that could generally monitor the sorts of um, activities that are going on in terms of uh, the biological research that are that is going on as a background in any given country. Uh, also the kinds of facilities that are in place to make sure they're running and up to scratch. Um, but if there is some kind of outbreak, and it does happen to be, especially if it happens to be in the vicinity of some sort of facility like we're, see, uh, like we're seeing in this particular outbreak, what we need is some sort of organization with a mandate to then go in and investigate and figure out what's going on, because that will then help us with our response to that. So I think that's the main way in which um, my emphasis on how we regulate um, biotechnology and uh, monitor it. Um, that's the way, way, main way in which my recommendations would be informed by COVID-19. Um, would this sort of uh, halfway house between security and the security world and the health world be acceptable to all states, well, it's hard to find consensus on a number of things these days. Um, one of the, which we are seeing again and, and again in the BWC. Um, last year, we had a terrific uh, meeting of experts with a lot of su substance debated. Once it came to the meeting of states parties, um, there was not 100% consensus. 
uh, on what should be taken out from those uh, meetings and all we were left with in the substantive section of the report from that meeting was no consensus could be found on any of the substance. And that's not, that's not productive. It's exactly what happened the year before as well. So we're having, we're constantly being blocked in the BWC or we are. States are constantly being blocked in the BWC in terms of outcomes and what they can act practically do. One of the benefits of the General Assembly is, of course, that there's voting. And so um, voting, of course, is not necessarily consensus driven. Ideally, you would want consensus, but I think voting can give a strong indication of where outliers might be or how strong of an opinion or how strong of a sentiment or feeling there is about a certain issue. So I think the uh, General Assembly is a good area or a good body to be negotiating this kind of institution uh, between the two worlds. Thank you, Philippa. And, uh, there is a, a, another open question that I think it's uh, very closely aligned to this issue of verification and, and perhaps uh, uh, because it's, uh, it's addressed to, to both of you, Nancy, I don't know if you would like to add to what Philippa just mentioned, but the question reads, you know, verification is always a major challenge discussed in the context of uh, bioweapons, which are more difficult to monitor than, for example, nuclear or chemical weapons. Um, how do speakers see the future of creating a reliable and resilient global verification regime for biotechnology? I'll make a couple of comments first, but, um, and um, Philip, I could take over. Uh, of course, you know, we've been talking about this uh, all the way through Varex and the Red and the Ad Hoc Group and, you know, for 30 years, 35 years. And um, <clears throat> I remember as a young scientist being involved in trying to, to put together a protocol. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think that the agreement on a formal verification inspections protocol is miles away. But I do feel that there are incremental um, advances, and, and as Philip always uses the term, a layered approach. And so, um, and so I think you know, um, peer uh, peer inspections, peer 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 review of programs, um, you know, uh, confidence building measures. CBM, if the CBMs are finally actually addressed adequately by all the states' parties, if there's some way that that <clears throat> there can be consequences for not um, for not completing CBMs and so on. Uh, other layered approaches are the is the scientific advisory mechanism of some kind, um, <clears throat> codes of conduct and so on. So I, I see really um, uh, a global verif verification regime that is that is comprised that comprises uh, a number of approaches rather than a single one. I mean, Philip had just carefully and clearly laid out the problems with consensus in the BWC. <clears throat> Thank you. Philippa, would you like to add something to this? I, I would, because Nancy mentioned the keyword, the protocol. And, um, you know, um, in the statements last week to first committee, there were a number of states that referred to COVID-19 and the sorts of implications uh, we're seeing of that kind of outbreak of a pandemic, a global pandemic right now, um, and holding it up as a kind of a stark example of what might happen if, um, if, if there is, um, if biological weapons were ever used. And many of the states said that this underscored the need for strengthening the BWC. Many states take strengthening the BWC to mean we need some sort of legally binding mechanism. A some use the word verification protocol. Others don't necessarily see a legally binding mechanism as a return to negotiations on a, a protocol. But clearly, I think what's being signaled in these statements, and there are really many countries who are referencing the need for a legally binding verification protocol. It's not just one group. Of course, it's primarily led 
by Russia and the NAM. But there are also many in the Western group and Eastern group who say we do need a legally binding mechanism here to ensure that states are adhering to their obligations under the convention. And so they're signaling that this is a priority for them at the review conference next year, which will of course complicate things like agreeing on a technical, dedicated technical uh, advisory board or working group because it'll end up having to be part of different some sort of package but I think it's important to know that verification isn't necessarily what it was envisioned to be back in the 1990s as Nancy has laid out innovation has moved on so far and so fast since then that we can't uh, just pick up where we left off in the 90s and Nancy was there, I wasn't yet. Um, I mean, I was here in the world, but I wasn't part of those discussions yet. Um, I came in just as they were all, uh, um, as it all fell apart. But um, I think what we need today is not actually to go back. What we need is a different conception of what verification is today and that is because dual use technologies and um, activities are becoming so ubiquitous that it doesn't make any sense to use an old sort of inspection regime that is based on a quantitative approach how big is your fermenter how many liters of this do you have how what is the size of your facility uh, how much money are you putting in? You can do things so cheap in such small places. And, you know, you, those are the wrong measurements to use for verification. I think what we need to see today is a much more qualitative focused verification. And I wouldn't call it a verification regime. I think that word is way too loaded. It's too reminiscent of A, uh, nuclear, the nu nuclear side and being able to say yes. Yeah, Yes no, or no, uh, it's too um, uh, either or. Um, and equally, it, it, it also carries this baggage from the, the protocol negotiations that is really not gonna help us move forward. Uh, it's better to talk about compliance assessment and compliance assessment today needs to be much more about um, information sharing. It needs to be about um, uh, sharing pro, uh, pre, you know, useful practices. It needs to be about engagement. So scientist to scientist, uh, for instance, it needs to be about bringing groups of people doing peers, essentially doing similar kinds of research together and talking about their practices and what they're doing to gain a general understanding, a big picture understanding of what it is they're doing. And only by doing that, only by getting states together to talk, uh, states, scientists, um, members of uh, civil protection and biodefense programs, only by getting these groups of people, and I think, by the way, civil society plays a very important role in this as well. Uh, as well. It is a way of maximizing transparency, of course, when you include civil society. So I think we need to have that kind of sustained, engaged dialogue over time. That's what we need to move towards when we're talking about compliance assessment and not a return to the helicopter in yes or no this is what this is and then come out with a, some sort of um, uh, verdict thank you and thank you for that and I the, you know we have a, a, a few more minutes and I wanted to uh, uh, use the last question that is posed by the audience to kind of go back to the concept of a, a kind of a, a systematic review of science and technology through some sort of advisory board the question reads, uh, uh, the CWC has an advisory board, could this not be applicable to the BWC? Now I'm gonna use this question for uh, 30 seconds of shameless self-promotion for Unidir as we are currently uh, undertaking a study that is looking exactly at this, at this issue. Over the, over the course of the last you know, 15 years or so, there have been uh, several proposals that have been put forward uh, by member states on how could this body look like but you know that is one source of potential, uh, uh, you know, 
knowledge uh, on, on this topic, but as was mentioned in the, in the question, the issue of establishing a, a science and technology review mechanism is not a, a unique issue of the DWC, and there are plenty of lessons and experiences that can be learned from other domains and, and other sectors. Philippa mentioned the open and the working group. That's one option, but it's not it's not the, the only option available. And what we're doing with, uh, with Unity now uh, is conducting a study that is exactly looking at um, uh, reviewing existing science and technology um, review mechanisms uh, outside of the context of, of uh, uh, biology and, and biological weapons conventions and try to identify a series of key features with the uh, ambition of uh, providing member states with the opportunity to basically build their own science and technology review mechanisms uh, you know, based on the specs that they that they prefer. So what should be, who should be involved? How big should it be? How often should it meet? What output should it produce? All of these key questions, some of which were covered in, in Philippa's presentation as well, are all questions that we are uh, currently uh, asking member states in the form of a survey. But we're not only asking questions, we're also providing a selection of answers that has been built from our analysis of over 20 other review mechanisms that exist. And the, the idea would be to inform the review conference next year with a selection of uh, possible options that uh, you know, member states could, could consider. And the, the question that I, uh, that I have uh, for you uh, both, uh, and that's kind of 30 seconds to wrap up. Um, and before I do that, you will have seen uh, the, in the chat box, the link to the feedback questionnaire. Please do fill it in uh, before leaving this meeting. So the, the last question uh, for both of you is that as we're entering the, the year of, of the RevCon uh, next year, you know, how, how do you see you know, the, the, the prospects of establishing this uh, s and review mechanisms going in? You know, we, it, it wouldn't be the first time uh, that the need of establishing something like this is considered, you know, where do you sit in 2021 uh, compared to where we were in previous instances of, of the RevCon? Yeah, um, maybe I'll speak first um, from a sort of technical point of view, and then Philippa can answer some of the um, some the more uh, sort of uh, um, from the point of view of of, of the um, the way that the treaty would be would would address the issues. What I what Final point I'd like to make is that um, we, uh, you know, it's biological weapons convention. We're thinking about weapons, but the technology, as we know, has real benefits. And I think one thing missing, and this it started to happen in the margins, some of the NGOs talking about this, certainly on the floor, states parties talking about the impact of biotechnology in their own countries and the and the great promise that has shown both economically but also to solve social and medical problems means that we need to think about uh, about a lot of these uh, advancing technologies um, on a continuum on a continuum so it isn't that it's dual use good bad uh, you know the the, the sort of um, duality of saying whether something is dual use or not uh, immediately pegs it as bad and and I, I think the idea of thinking about all these technologies on a continuum from you know good at one end, risky at the other, where does it lie in terms of development of its uh, usability as a weapon or requirements of actors, potential for mitigation and so on. So to that end, um, the idea uh, in the meantime, as we're trying to set up a scientific advisory mechanism, would be to have a, um, uh, you know, at every, at every MX um, and probably at the states at MSP as well because of the involvement of delegates, of, the delegates uh, um, uh, who aren't used to this thing, um, to thinking this way, is um, is a is a full day meeting looking at what's happened over the past year um, in in technology and using a set of frameworks and so on. So I just will give a shameless plug on my part for the IAP for the Inter Academy panel who has been uh, working on developing such a framework and adapting it for um, non scientist delegates to use to understand CRISPR to understand machine learning and so on, and how it applies um, to their, uh, to the BWC. Thanks. Thank you. Philippa, over to you. First, let me just say how great I think this 
study that UNIDIR is undertaking at the moment is. Uh, there will be many of us who are really keen to hear the outcome of that. So yes. uh, great job and carry on uh, and, and get the results out soon. <laughs> uh, secondly, the idea of uh, an advisory body or a review, some sort of review institution related to the BWC is something civil society has been pushing for years. We've now finally also got some states championing mm -hmm. this idea much more strongly. Uh, Germany, for instance, has, I think, been leading this. There are, all, of course, also been other states involved, Sweden, the Netherlands, um, in the UK. Um, there have been lots of states also very keen on trying to get this in place, but you've got to, uh, Russia, you've, but you've got to get the right mechanism in place. And this is really what the difficulty is. And as I already indicated earlier, I think also this idea around needing to find a package at the review conference that everyone, it'll be part of a package. It won't be a standalone thing. It'll end up being part of a package. So it may or it may not go through uh, um, that sort of remains to be seen, you would hope at least that the current pandemic would spur mm -hmm. some action on that front. Um, but, uh, but um, you know, when it comes to the BWC, it's sort of hard to be hopeful, but we do try. Uh, I think the worry really is if we don't get this kind of review board, um, individual states and leading states will more and more do the fulfill this function on their own, take it outside the BWC and do it on their own in smaller groups. There are already some states doing that. At the moment, they're still feeding that into the BWC processes, but um, it would fragment uh, the multilateral um, oversight mechanism more and more. So um, I would be wary to see that happen. So um, my hope is, there will be some kind of agreement on the need for a review mechanism. Good, thank you. And on this positive note, I think it's time to uh, uh, wrap up and uh, uh, enter the kind of the final uh, phase of this meeting with the, the thank yous. So first of all, uh, thanks to uh, the donors of the Security and Technology Program. So Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Switzerland, and Microsoft that have been supporting the work of uh, our program, including the Innovation Dialogue on which this, this event is, is based. Thank you to Philippa and Nancy for being with us today and sharing your views on what are some very uh, uh, interesting, topical, but sometimes even uh, difficult topics. Uh, you know, so really appreciate the fact that uh, you took time today to, to share your experiences and views with us. And uh, last but not least, thank to uh, all of you who participated and submitted very interesting questions. Uh, really pleased of how the conversation went. So I wish you uh, a good rest of the day if you're based in the US or the afternoon uh, if you're based in Europe or Asia. And with that, uh, the meeting is over. And thank you so much again for coming.